All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back again to Vinny Presents. Today, I got my buddy back in studio, Nick Christopher's author, writer, inside guy that knows a whole lot about what most of us really can't even talk about. Nick Christopher, welcome back, my friend. Thank you, Vinny. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's always a delight to have you on board. We, last time we, we, we hung out, we had a lot of a lot of uh, attention and a lot of uh, people calling me up and telling me, wow, that guy was great. And hopefully it sold some books. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Usually it doesn't work that way, but who knows? <laughs> but no, it was a great interview, and I'm, I'm, so, I'm so happy to have you back on. So, Nick, what's going on? What's new in your world, brother? Um, well, like we were discussing off camera a little while ago, um, I'm almost done with my fifth book. Uh, should be done in the next day or two. I should be finished. Uh, that one's going to be called uh, Flowers Are Not Forever. Uh, again, it's a mob story, but not really. It's a little different. It's more of a thriller. Um, and I mean, I could get, I could throw people a little bit of a pitch of what it's about, you know, synopsis, so to speak. Um, it's about this guy. His name is Caesar. He's an assassin. He's a hired contract killer for everybody and anybody, you know, so not for any specific mob or anything like that. He works for everybody, Greeks, Jews, Italians, French, Japanese, whatever. He does it all. And um, he, uh, he's, uh, he's half Greek, half Albanian. I had to bring my people in somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, uh, as a cover, he owns a, he runs a flower shop. Hence, flowers are not forever. And uh, he runs a flower shop. And he does a couple of hits for a lot of different people. And he has an MO that's very weird. So every time he goes to whack somebody, he makes a voodoo doll of them. Like, for example, let's say he's going to go whack Vinny. What he does, he makes a little doll with a red shirt, red sweater, baseball cap, little goatee, mustache, whatever, a pair of jeans, whatever. Look where the camera, the voodoo doll looks like you. So he, before he goes to take out a hit, he makes the voodoo doll and starts sticking pins where he's going to shoot them. And he, after when he comes home, after he does the hit, he takes the needles out of the voodoo doll and puts them on a shelf, like like trophies. And that's where he has all his hits, like all these little voodoo dolls all over his shelf in his house. Uh, so that's like his, his, oh, and every time he whacks someone, he leaves a flower on the body's chest. That's his, like, calling card. So he, he while he's doing all this, he meets a woman that comes into his flower shop. And he, you know, gets involved with her. They start dating, blah, blah, blah. She doesn't know his real name is Caesar. He tells her his name is Chris. He doesn't want her to know what his real life is. But when he takes her out, he treats her like a complete gentleman. Really nice guy. But things started to, things eventually start to crumble. The FBI is trying to, starts to eventually slowly putting the pieces together. Figure out who this guy is. And eventually they kind of, they, don't, they get really, really close. And um, the girl, too, unfortunately. The girl, you know, she goes to visit him at his flower shop. He's not there. But he gives her a key. So she, she's able to get in whenever she feels like it. That's how much he trusts her. So she goes one day. She goes there. She goes in the shop. She's waiting for him. He's not there. So she goes in the back, and she wants to get a bottle of water from the fridge. She opens the fridge, and she sees a, a bloody towel with a knife, with a butcher knife. Towel's all full of blood. She fucking freaks out. Oh my god! And while she's there, she hears like these human, like grunting voices. And she looks like through it, like a closet door, and sees a guy chained to a a, be a chair, all full of blood. Now she's really fucking freaking. Oh my god! So when she's going through this like traumatic experience, he walks in, and she's like, "Chris, oh my god, blood." Guy in the back, and she's like, nah, it's a Halloween prank. Don't worry about it. It's okay. You sure? Yeah, yeah. As she turns around to grab her the water, he kills her. He shoots her. And then he buries her in the flowers that she always bought from the flower shop. Wow. That's why it's called Flowers and Not Forever. So that's the premise of the story. That's really good, man. And it sounds like it sounds like a very good story, well thought out, very good narrative. I like it. Very cool. 
Yeah, thanks. It's almost, almost done. <laughs> well, now I want to wish you luck with that, but let's tell the audience for those that the few people out there that may not know you, tell them a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I've, I've been writing for like 20 some odd years, and uh, growing up, I grew up around a lot of you know, saw a lot of wise guys that used to come to my friend, my father's cafe. Um, I was in a gang when I was thir- when I was 13. I got pinched when I was 21 for assault. So I hung around a lot of these street kind of people, and it, I, it actually, I obviously, you know, how you say, what's the word? It got it rubbed on me, you know, and I almost went the wrong direction completely, but I didn't, thank God. And um, I owe that to my father, really. And they, they kind of put me on the right path, kind of, so to speak. But then again, you know, after getting pinched and being in a, in a, in a lockup, you know, gives you time to think. And it really, I never forget it. There was a guy next to me in the other cell, and uh, a black guy, and he's banging on my cell. He goes, yo, brother. I say, hey, what's up? He goes, do yourself a favor. Get out of this any way you can. This is not the road to take. Believe me, I've been here for nine years. It's not good. So that kind of, you know, that left you with something to think about. So. Thank God to him. Thank God to my father. It kind of like maybe didn't take me away from those guys. I still hung out with them. I just didn't go down the path of criminality, so to speak, you know. And then instead of going down the path, I said wrote about it instead. <laughs> well, you, you wanted a few that actually were able to not get, you know, sucked in, and uh, maybe you, you tiptoed around the edge, but you didn't fall over. Thank God. So no. But, but I the, mean, I was, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I got very enamored by guys like that. I mean, I knew a lot of them personally. And um, if you remember the movie Donnie Brasco, the character that James Russo played was my friend. And I hung out with John a few times and a uh, really cool guy. I had a good time with him. Um, the Vicarina. Vicarina was the boss of the Colombo family, acting boss. He lived three blocks away from me. I knew the whole family. Hung out with them, knew them very well, great people. Um, so I was around it a lot, Greeks and Italians. So it, it's um, it's like Henry Hill, like in Goodfellas. It's you get attracted to it and you get sucked into it, like you said, because you see all the money, the brajo, women, guys that don't know brajo was. Uh, <laughs> so you see all that and you get, you, I mean, you get. It attracted to it, especially at a young age, 12, 13 years old. You know, I mean, I ran my own football tickets at that, day, at that age. You know, you know, I was making money and having the kids bet with me. So at, at that age, making $500 a week doing nothing, you know. That's a lot of money back then, too. Oh, yeah, back in the early 80s? Oh, big time. No, no, 80s. What am I talking about? Since 1970, let me see, 1977, 78. So... That's a lot of money back. So, we're a junior high school kid. You know, that's a lot. Well, seventies, uh, you wouldn't, you would know better than me, Nick. But I would say, what? What was the la- what was the peak? The peak era of the mob in, in America? Would it be the seventies, eighties, maybe? No, the peak was the fifties. Fifties, yeah. Big time. The fifties. They controlled everything and anything. Nobody touched them. I mean, the like the, in a movie again, Goodfellas, inaccurate as it is. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into all that because I can rip all these movies apart. But Goodfellas, in the beginning, when you see like Paul Silvino was sitting in the backyard eating a f- sandwich, and Henry Hill, like uh, Ray Liotta, was dick, uh, um, r- narrating how they had everything in their pocket because they did. They ran everything back then. There wasn't anything they didn't run. So I think their peak was in the 50s, in the 60s too, 70s to some degree, in the 80s, yes. Uh, but it started, you know, the late 80s, it started going down a little slowly. But I think after after John Gotti went to prison in 92, I think that was a sign that this is where this, this is going to collapse, you know, eventually. It's not it's still around, don't get me wrong. The guys are still there, but they're just not, uh, like a lot of people here at a lot of other shows, they're just not at their, they're done pretty much, I mean. The Mexicans are very powerful. Mexican cartels, the Colombians, uh, the Yakuza, and the Triads, they didn't, they didn't go nowhere. They're still around. 
uh, go the Italian mob outside of Sicily, like the Negrata or the Camorra, outside of those two, the American mafia pretty much is almost done. <laughs> well, I think, I think, I think, and you probably would agree with this. I think it's, it's, it's a combination of things. But let's not forget the government took over the rackets. <laughs> oh no! I mean, if you tell me who's the stronger, who's the biggest mafia, it's the government. They're the biggest mafia of them all. And I, I, what I had this discussion with somebody the other day, as a matter of fact. If you look at, let's put it this way. I would trust a mob guy a lot faster than a politician any day. Reason being, people would look at me like, what are you nuts? He's a criminal. Yeah, I know he's a criminal. I know he's going to screw me. Because that's what I'm expecting. So that's what he is. That means he's very true to himself. Politician, on the other hand, he's a law maker. He's supposed to follow the law. He's supposed to do the right thing. He's supposed to help us. We He worked for us. We don't work for him. And they go on TV and say, yeah, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Meantime, five months later, after they get elected, forget about it. They'll do nothing. So they're hypocrites. Mob guys, and I can admit to this even now, there's a guy I called the other day. His name is Ronnie Kern. He used to call him the Rottweiler. He was one of the last of the Jewish gangsters from New Jersey. Tough guy. Very, very tough guy. Good boxer, too. And He's not involved in that life anymore. He's out of that life for a while now. And um, I, I called him the other day and I needed a favor. Nothing major. Very simple thing. Need help with an event I'm trying to put together. Lo and behold, he, he hooks me up with a guy who's going to help me try to get this thing done. The point I'm trying to make is these guys, you ask them for something, they get it done not because they like you or not because they they're a good guy. They want to prove that they can do something. They don't want to prove that they can't get something done. Because that makes them look lesser of a power. They don't have the power. They want to prove it. That's what I like about those kind of guys. I'm not saying they're good men or they're angels. No. But in comparison, at least they get the job done. <laughs> Gotta say that much. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, and you grew up around these people, so it goes without saying, but there's... Uh, me being a little boy, seeing some of my dad's friends and uncles and different people that I, there was a certain element where they would still tip their hat. They would, when a, when a woman walked by, they would still, um, if they could help you with something, they would help you. If they need, if you need a job, they would give you, they would give you a hand. Of course, you know, they did what they did. They did what they had to do, but there was that certain type of gangster, you might say, or mafioso, whatever you want to say, but they had they had class. There was that that yeah. You know, there's still a few left, maybe, but there was just something about that that generation. Yeah, yeah. Like, you said, like you said earlier, they want to prove that they have a power. They have a, a way of getting things done. And at the same, they have a split personality, in my opinion. If you watch Tony Soprano and the shows, even though it's fiction, it pretty much shows how they are. Here's Tony Soprano who goes home to his wife and kid kids and loves his kids and loves his wife and he acts like it's like any other father in the house. But you take him out of that element and he's with the boys, he's a total animal. But we'll crack your head open with a bat. So they had a very weird combination of split personalities where they were total gentlemen and good family men. They went to church on Sunday with their wives or whatever. At night they just cracked the guy's head open. So they, it's, it's uh, very those the Italian mob and the Greeks and I think the Irish too, um, they live a kind of split personality, dual world world. They live in two different worlds, you know. Whereas even the Chinese too, the Chinese triads, they ran they ran all the tongues in Chinatown, and believe it or not, they're very gentlemanly like. They're very very. Uh, they don't take they don't put up with a, um, you know, uh, bullshit. They don't put up. They don't like even the Chinatown gangs, the Flying Dragons, uh, the Ghost, uh, the Ghost Shadows. A lot of these Chinese tribes don't even like those kind of guys. They just use them. They use them for you know small time stuff. But and but they control them in a certain degree where it doesn't make them look bad. So it's it's, it's kind of a weird balance that they have. The community itself in Chinatown, it's the move. It's it's the most pleasant place you want to be. It's it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, you're right. It's 100 percent correct. Even look, even Little Italy in 
Well, not anymore. It's not even little anymore. It's more like teeny weeny. In Manhattan, Little Italy, back in the day, you walked around Little Italy, you never saw anything bad. You never saw a shoplifter. You never saw somebody uh, mugging somebody on the street. It just didn't happen because they knew better, you know. And it's I know it sounds cliche, but usually wise guys, wherever they eat, drink, and live, it's usually the, <laughs> the, low, the crime rate doesn't even exist. It's like bizarre, but it's true because the low-level criminals who do the muggings and the shoplifting and all that stuff know better than the dude in those areas because they know what's going to happen. You know, they're going to get the head busted. They're going to, you know, the, the wise guys are going to find them. The biggest, the biggest deterrent. Now, Nick, let's get into, if you feel like it, let's get into, I know you, you have a, uh, you're very annoyed by some of these movies because of the, they're really not based in too much facts. <laughs> I'm curious to ask you about a movie that's local here that was, that was, you know, done a few years back, the Irishman. Now oh. I can tell you some stuff that I know for sure is inaccurate <laughs> because I knew some of the family members, but, I'll let you get into that. Do you want to? Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I don't know every single tiny detail, but a lot of it is inaccurate. Frank Sheeran, first of all, was on his deathbed when he was uh, narrating his story, his life story, which most of it is not really true. Um, Frank Sheeran was yes. Was he close to Jimmy Hoffa? Yeah. Was he close to Buff Buffalino? Yes, but um, not to the point where. He was um, in charge of killing Jimmy Hoffa. He never killed Jimmy Hoffa. That never happened. He was not there. He didn't shoot him in a house. That's not accurate either. Um, so that's not, you know, true. Um, he didn't know Joey Gallo. That didn't happen either. Uh, Joey Gallo and Matt Frank Sheeran. I mean, come on, really? Uh, so there's a lot of the things in there that are just totally inaccurate and just thrown in there. Um, Willie D'Elia was a took over for Russell Buffalino when Russell died, or when he actually not before he died, before when he got sick. When Russell got really really sick and he wasn't able to control the family, Billy D'Elia took the, took his place. Now William D'Elia or Billy D'Elia knew Frank Sheeran very well, and they you know because they knew they worked with Russell Buffalino. Russell Buffalino was very tight with Jimmy Hoffa, and he actually okayed, indirectly, okay to hit on Hoffa. Um, not because he wanted to do it, because he was pressured to do it by a lot of the other big wise guys, like Tony Provenzano, like Sally Bugs. I think, me, I believe Sally Bugs killed Jimmy Hoffa, my opinion. I think it was Sally. Um, but it, nobody's really knows the fact, it's not, it, hasn't, it still hasn't really come out who it really was. It's just crazy. But those things didn't happen. You know, Frank Sheeran killing him in the, shooting half in the house, that didn't happen. Uh, him meeting Joey Gallo, that didn't happen. Uh, there's some other things, like when Russell Pavolino went on the road trip um, with Frank. Uh, as far as I remember, Frank wasn't in the car. Billy D'Elia was in the car with his wife. And they went together to Detroit. Then they switched the planes and they flew over to the other... Uh, I forget they went to Cleveland, I believe, if I remember correctly. So there's a lot, you know, those things are what I saw that is not accurate uh, from not just by being told this, also by somebody who was actually close with Russell's daughter. So it's, I got it from a lot of different sources. So, Well, I would say that a <laughs> typical... For Scorsese, and it's not yeah. a knock because I'm a, I admire him uh, greatly, but typical Scorsese takes a lot of creative license. <laughs> well, he does it with every movie. Yeah. I mean, Goodfellas is completely wrong from the beginning to the end. It was completely inaccurate. Henry Hill wasn't that big of a shot. He was small time drug dealer, con man. He wasn't that big at all. Ray Liotta made him look like a god, and Ray Liotta was a lot better looking than Henry Hill. I'll tell you that. And uh, that's for sure. Uh, Tommy D, even though I love Joe Pesci, he played him. He played his. He played the character, the uh, persona of Jim, of Tommy D very well. But Tommy D was a tall guy. He was like six foot, big guy, mustache, wore a leather jacket a lot at the time. Not so much a, a tie and a suit. Very rare. Um, 
and Jimmy Paul Sovino never really had a conversation with Henry Hill about drugs, telling him about, you know, Carmine Tremuti that I don't want to be like him. I don't want to end up in prison. So that thing, kind of like conversation, never really happened. Um, Tommy D uh, did get shot, yes, because because of Billy Bass. That is true. Um, and but it wasn't. He wasn't shot in a house. He was shot somewhere else. And supposedly, rumor had it that John Gotti is the one who killed him. See, that's how he got his bones. Supposedly, I don't believe that. But because there's no real proof that he did. Um, but like I said, like Martin took a lot of even Gangs of New York, which is a great movie, I loved it. But they weren't that violent. That movie showed them like they were cycles. I mean, the way they killed each other, it wasn't that, it wasn't that bad. Not like that. It was a little too much. They took it to another level. <laughs> would you say, speaking of Buffalino, would you say that Buffalino was maybe one of the top top guys? In, I mean, was he bigger than Gambino at their at their peaks? I think they were equal. Definitely, Russell Buffalino was the quiet Don, uh, and as they say. He was very good at being discreet, quiet. He didn't like publicity. Didn't want to be in the papers. Uh, like Carlo, very much like Carlo. Uh, but I think they were equal in power. Russell had a lot, a lot. I mean, he was a boss of uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, in that area, the Pittston uh, area, of PA. Which you would think, oh well, it's a small little area. How was he the such a big boss from all over the country? But he was. He had power in all through the whole country, from New York to California. He was extremely powerful. He sat on the commission. He had a lot to do with the Cuban situation with Cadet Castro. He had a lot to do with um, decisions that were being made in New York with Carlo and um, Genovese and uh, Costello. So yeah, this guy had extremely amount of power. What about uh, also? I think another big wig might have been oh, no, might have been definitely was uh, Carlos um, Marcello. Marcello, right? Yeah, Carlos. Yeah, definitely Carlos Marcello. He was he had a he had a big how do you say uh, stone in his shoe, as they say in Italian. <laughs> and a little saying: I got a stone in my shoe. I need to be removed. Meaning there's somebody that's bothering you. And Carlos had that big stone in his shoe because it was the Kennedys. Yeah. Because they tried to deport him. Back and they, I think they almost did. And um, I have a funny feeling that Carlos had something to do with Kennedy's assassination. Either either the president or Bobby. One or the other. I think most so Bobby because Bobby, see the Kennedy people don't realize, I think a lot of people don't realize that the Kennedys were not good people. They were bad. Joe Kennedy ran, was a bootlegger. Right. He, he ran, and he was a son of a bitch. He wasn't a good guy. He backstabbed the mob, I don't know how many times. How he was still walking around, I don't know. But he backstabbed them a lot. And when they, I mean, he went to Sam Giancana and to Carlos Marcello and to ask for his help in getting uh, Robert Kennedy, I mean, John F. Kennedy elected. And they made it happen. And what he did, what, what, what happened when he turned around? Bobby Kennedy was going to go after all the mob. So that's like you're backstabbing us. You know? why, do you, why do you think he did that, Nick? I think Bobby, Bobby was a lot different than John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy, um, who got into office because of the mob, he wasn't really out to get them. He was pretty much content where he was, I believe. And But Bobby was a different... Different cut from a different cloth. I think Bobby was very resentful. Didn't like the Italians. I don't think he liked the mob at all. He just played along for a little while, and so he could get. So he had hookers come to his room. Bobby and Bobby and John were not faithful husbands. They, they were worse than wise guys. These guys had gumas everywhere. And well, Nick, let, you know, you said something that that really uh, made some sense to me there, which was, well, two things that. Robert Kennedy probably had something against Italians. I know it sounds a little stupid, but then back in the day, there was that like cultural discrimination, hatred, envy, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. That probably was a, a small part of it, but a bigger part was he probably knew he had to do what he had to do to get where he had to get to. And then he figured, you know what? I don't want these guys controlling me, so I'm going to take them out. That's a very good point. That's very possible. 
you know. But I think Bobby was always resented the fact that you know his dad had to answer to the wise guys. He had to confer in them, blah blah blah. So I think he developed this prejudice of Italians, and especially the mob, and wanted to do everything in his power to dismantle them. And it's like, like when he was trying to do that, John F. Kennedy wasn't really involved in it. He didn't, he didn't hear. He wasn't there at the. You know, he wasn't really involved in 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 prolonging this. And uh, Bobby Kennedy just, you know, he set himself up because you know you backstab the wise guys. They put your brother in office, and now you're going after them. I mean, what do you expect to happen? So, um, and don't forget, the, John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy hung out with Frank Sinatra. They were close with him. Why? Let's take a wild guess. Because the wise guys were around Frank Sinatra. Sam Giancana was around Bobby Kennedy and John F. Kennedy. But a lot of the general public doesn't know that. You know, a lot of people think John F. Kennedy was one of the best presidents we ever had. He didn't last very long for us to even know if he was good or bad. And people don't really knew. I think now people, in the past maybe a couple of years, they've realized that the Kennedys were not all squeaky clean as we think they were. Um, and Nick, I think what happened was too now, and it's, it, it, I'm just thinking of this stuff really just now, but it could have been, and this is all just my imagination here running wild, but Lyndon, Lyndon B. Johnson, maybe he was more controllable, controllable than JFK was. So maybe that was the move, you know, let's get him to take over because we could control him. I don't know that for a fact, but it's, it's, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. Just like Jay, just like Hoover, same thing. The wise guys had photographs or something. Right. So he held something over his head where Hoover denied that the mob even existed. Not until later on, when he got more pressure from Kennedy, that he started the, you know, uh, started a task force to go after organized crime. Prior to that, he totally ignored it, like it didn't exist. So um, I think, Bob, don't forget, the Irish and Italians always had, you know, they didn't like it. Always. So I think that also plays a role. That the rivalry, the hatred between the two. The Italians didn't like the Irish because the Irish cops used to beat up the Italians. The Italians, the Irish didn't like the Italians because you saw them as um, uh, savages, like whatever yeah. they called them. They didn't give them jobs. They because uh, the Irish were in America first before the Italians were. Well, the yeah. Irish, the Irish got a lot of a lot of political jobs and a lot of union jobs. That's cool. The Irish ran everything. Tammany Hall was. A lot of it was Irish control because they were here first, you know. So they, they that's true in Philly too. It was true in Philadelphia too. Yeah, Philly, New York, Chicago. The Irish uh, ran a lot of the political machine. So you know, when the Italians or Sicilians or Napolitans came over, they looked at these people like, "Who are these guys?" And that I think that created a lot of you know tension between the two. And that's what I think. I think some of that spilled over to Bobby Kennedy. Like he remembers, oh, how they treated us and blah blah. I think I, I think I had something to do with it, in my opinion. And I, I think you're right. I think you're right. And I also think that me, if I'm in a position of power, you start to get annoyed with those that helped you. If they, because they, of course they're going to ask you for favors left and right, you know. So he probably figured, you know, these guys are going to keep bothering me. That I, I got, I don't want to owe nobody. So I want to, I want to, I want to clip their wings a little bit. That's possible too. But I, th- yeah, I think it was also a. Um, he had a bit of a prejudice towards him. Prejudice, yeah. So I yeah. think that was it. You mentioned Sinatra, and I forget where I heard this, uh, let's say, rumor. But <clears throat> the rumor goes that Sinatra, you know, he started obviously in uh, Hoboken, North Jersey. He had his connections in New York. But later on, he became big time. And so he was very close, as you said, and as we know, with Sam Giancana. But then I think he ran into some sort of a problem. And then he went to New York, and I forget who it was he may have spoken to. It was a boss, and they said, you know, why are you coming to us for? You you abandoned us. Go back to Sam. Did uh, you, hear, you ever hear that story? Not, not really. I don't think I did. But if he went to New York at that time when Sam was around, had to be Carlo he went to talk to. There would have been nobody else to talk to except Carlo. Um, so he might have went there, and, and Carlo might have said it because – I don't know if you ever saw this. There's a famous photograph of him backstage, one of his performances, and you have every almost all the top wise guys were there. 
And I find that hard to believe that he would even that those guys would even take a picture like that. Well, you know, I guess back then they weren't. It wasn't on their mind that this is going to go public, because uh, it really didn't. It really didn't like appear in the newspaper or nothing. It appeared years later. You know, people didn't see that photograph until many, many years after. You know, uh, but it was crazy. You're right. You had Greg DePalma in the picture. You had Jimmy Frontiano from California. You had uh, Carlo Gambino in the picture. Paul Castellano. It's uh, it's it is a remarkable photograph, not for nothing. <laughs> it is. It, you almost think like, wow, I can't believe this actually exists. Well, listen, Nick, let's talk a little bit more about what you're up to, what, you, what you've already accomplished, and some ways that the people can find you. Um, well, um, well, they find me at nickchristophers.org. Um, Nick Christopher is really in. You just Google my name, you'll find a million things, more or less. Uh, <laughs> I do have my own show uh, called Mob Tales, which I interview ex-wise guys, or most of them friends of mine, and the actors who play those kind of roles. Uh, I do that every weekend. Uh, Saturdays typically that are pre-recorded and we put it up uh, on YouTube. Uh, so I have that going on. Um, I'm finishing my fifth book now. Almost done the one I was telling you about, Flowers Are Not Forever. And I'm working on doing an, trying to organize an event which is part fundraiser, part charity uh, to work on my next film um, and also raising funds for animal rescue because I love dogs. I have one of my own, love animals. So I want to do something where it helps uh, animal rescue to help, you know, to help get rescue dogs, cats, whatever that are abandoned in the streets or not, who are being abused most of all, uh, which is, they're glad I don't find them, people that are abusing any of these animals. Um, but I got that, that stuff going on, and I am working on an idea on a sixth book, which is, <laughs> believe it or not, another one, uh, which is not mob related at all, completely. Crazy thriller. I don't, I don't want to tell you about it just yet. Um, but that's going to be a really good story once I get my mind to it. But, yeah, so that's what I'm kind of, like, working on, trying to get my film made, you know, looking for investors to get the project off the ground called Destinies, which is based on my first book. So that's kind of what my fingers are all at now. <laughs> well, the word on the street is Nick Christopher is a fantastic writer, and I agree with that. So that's Thank true. You. I'm not making that up. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, listen, Nick, I got to say, man, it's been a, a pleasure that you, you joined us again. I appreciate you making the time. I know it's been a long day for you, but, you know, all, all my guests really enjoy these interviews I do with you. And I, I look forward to speaking with you again next time I talk to you. Hopefully you got some some great news for us and hopefully you get finance with your movie. And I'm sure whatever you do is going to going to pan out really well. And I'm always here to support you as well as the guests. I appreciate it, Vince. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Again, folks, please, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube. If you're listening on any of the platforms, iHeart and Amazon and Google, keep listening, keep subscribing, and make sure, make sure you follow Nick Christopher's. The description box will have all his links. Thanks again, Nick. We'll catch up with you very soon, I'm sure. No problem, buddy. Thank you. Take care. Ciao. Take care.